video 54 of the master course quantum chemistry of molecular electromagnetic properties the topic of this lecture is excitation energies and transition moments if you go back to chapter 3 and look at the sum of states expression for the linear response function we can see that the linear response function will have a singularity if the frequency of the external radiation is equal to the energy difference between one of the excited states and the ground state divided by h bar where this energy difference we normally call the vertical ele electronic excitation energy and it's called vertical because it's the energy of the excited state n at the same geometry as of the ground state zero here and we denote that by uh, delta E and zero. So it's the vertical electronic excitation energy, which is the energy difference between the unperturbed states, the ground state and the excited state. So if the energy of the incoming radiation of the incoming photon is equal to this excitation energy here, then our linear response function will have a singularity or a pole as one also calls it. And that means that we actually can determine the vertical ex electronic excitation energies by finding these values of the frequencies for which the linear response function of polarization propagator has a singularity slash pole. So that gives us the excitation energies of the system. If you're also interested in the transition moments, then we have to look at the residuum corresponding to this pole. And the residuum of a, a function is a function which has singularities, which has poles, is uh, obtained by taking the function, here our linear response function, and multiplying it by the variable of the function, which in our case, of course, is the frequency omega, so the variable, minus the value of the variable for which the function has the singularity of the pole. And then one lets the variable take the limit of the variable going to this value for which the uh, response function has, or the function in general, has its singularity pole. That, of course, means that um, this one becomes zero here. But, uh, um, and this, in principle, separately would uh, become infinite. But the product of those two will have then a finite value. And this finite value, which one obtains by uh, letting the function go to the uh, position where the singularity is, but multiplying it by this difference here, this finite value which comes out is called the residuum of a, a function which has a singularity. And if one looks at the sum over states expression uh, in chapter 3, and does precisely that, um, here, taking the response function, multiplying it with this factor, and then letting uh, omega goes to omega uh, and zero, the the frequency of the excitation energy, then one can see what one gets is just the numerator of the sums, which uh, um, is called the transition strength, actually, because it's a square. So it's a square, the absolute square of the transition moment, which is also called the transition strength. So if you can find a way how to do that with our response function, I mean, not in the form uh, of the sum of states expression, or spectral representation, but in, for example, from the matrix representation, which we have for our linear response function, we can find a way how to take this limit here. Um, then what we will get out, we know, will be this transition strength. And that, of course, is transition strength, um, as we know, is related to the intensity of the absorption. Now let's look a bit more in detail at these transitions. And in particular, let's have a look at uh, how these operators look like. Now in the first chapter of uh, chapter seven, we had uh, a general, very general expression for the vector potential of um, radiation, electromagnetic radiation. Um, and with this vector potential, uh, our first order perturbation Hamiltonian takes this form. This is just the first order term we don't consider the second order term. So we have our vector potential scalar product with the canonical momentum of the electrons. Uh, inserting this in uh, our expression for the transition rate, which we also have derived in 
a subchapter of chapter three, uh, we get this expression here, where we have sum over the different components because here we had a scalar product, so it's writing the scalar product out. Uh, and um, A here, that is the amplitude of the vector potential of the radiation. So this is just the amplitude. Um, and all the rest is included here in uh, this transition strength again. And inserting it, we can see that our transition moment here from the ground state, to, from the unperturbed ground state to the unperturbed excited state, the operator is looks like this, where here we have our canonical momentum operator or a Cartesian component of the canonical momentum operator. And here, that is what is left from the, that is actually the spatial dependence of our vector potential here. That's the exponential with uh, the wave, the scalar product of the wave vector and the position of um, where we evaluate the um, vector potential. And of course, in our case here, that's the position of uh, the electrons. And outside, then here again, the, the amplitude squared. Now, one could, and maybe one should also, uh, in principle, just evaluate these transition moments with this general expression for, for the operator. Um, but that's actually not what one normally does. Uh, what one normally does when use the expansion of this exponential, which we looked at before in chapter uh, seven. So let's do that. So the first of this expansion was just one, uh, which means that uh, the only operator left is the canonical. The first term, um, as we found, the first term of this expansion is just a one momentum operator. And here, um, the capital OP, that's just the sum over the canonical momentum operators for all electrons. Uh, and taking the first term of the expansion of the uh, exponential describing the position dependence of the vector potential that we call this the dipole approximation. Originally, it was called the long wavelength approximation, but uh, normally it's also called just the dipole approximation, which means that we ignore the spatial variation of the vector potential and therefore the spatial variation of the electric and magnetic fields. Then we get this transition moment here with the canonical momentum operator, the sum of the canonical momentum operators of all the electrons. Now we can use the uh, off-diagonal hypervariable relation, which we had derived in uh, chapter three, which relates transition moments of the canonical momentum operator of all the electrons to transition moments over the position operator of the all the electrons uh, based on the uh, well-known uh, commutation relation that the commutator of the position operator with a Hamiltonian is equal to, essentially with some constants, equal to the canonical momentum operator. So using this one, which is the help uh, the off the eigen hyper relation, we can rewrite our transition rate in this form here, where we have now a transition moment over the position vector of uh, the electrons, or some of the position vectors of all the electrons. And we get an additional factor, which is again our excitation energy, excitation energy squared, because there's a square up here. Now I can write this transition moment also uh, more conveniently in form of the electric dipole moment operator, because the electric dipole moment operator is nothing else than just a sum over the position vectors of the electrons multiplied by their charge. So it's times minus E, uh, which essentially removes the E here. Uh, so I can write it in terms of the electric dipole moment operator, which means these are dipole transition moments. And that means that making this long wavelength approximation also called the dipole approximation. At the end, we arrive at an expression for the transition rate, which includes the absolute square of the transition moment of the dipole, dipole moment operator. And that's the reason why this long wavelength approximation is also called the uh, dipole approximation. And um, the transition moments are the electric dipole transition moments, which often are identified by this expression here. I mean, M and zero, M and zero, this part uh, means it's a transition moment. And the E means it's the electric, so because it's electric dipole. And the one stands for dipole, so it's the electric dipole transition moment. So that was the first term 
in the expansion of the e to the i k dot r operator representing the spatial dependence of the vector potential therefore of the electromagnetic fields now going to the next term which means um, we have an i k dot r like this uh, which is the next term and which now takes into account the spatial variation of the vector potential and which means the electric magnetic field over the molecule okay in order to make the derivation about a bit easier uh, let's consider a particular case and let's consider that uh, we have a uh, radiation traveling along the x z axis so the z axis is uh, in which the radiation uh, propagates which means that this k vector which is the wave vector the propagation vector only has a set component and in vacuum we know that um, the wave vector the norm of the wave vector is actually the frequency of the radiation divided by uh, the speed of light so our set component therefore is um, and if you look at the wave with exactly the frequency of the excitation so it's our excitation energy divided by a speed of light so that's the that's k in this situation and uh, let's assume that our um, wave is polarized linear polarized or plane polarized in the x direction so it's propagating in the z direction and it's then of course uh, um, the electromagnetic field vectors will oscillate in direction which are perpendicular to set and let's just assume that it's a uh, uh, plane polarized along this x-axis which means that the we have the component of the canonical momentum operator we are looking at is the x component which means we have a transition moment of this form here where we have here set uh, which comes from the propagation of the wave vector of the wave and the x component because the electric field vector is uh, oscillating in the x correction now that so we have z times p x both of course z position of the electrons and the um, x component of the canonical momentum operator of the electrons and that should remind us of um, expression for a component of the angular momentum and actually it's the y component of the angular momentum but it's only half of it um, of course one just could evaluate i mean if we want to calculate uh, this next contribution to the um, transition moments and therefore to the transition rate one actually could just um, calculate this um, but in order to get sort of a physical understanding of it we're going to rewrite this here uh, um, and the first thing what we do is since this is sort of half of the expression for the y component of the angular momentum operator of the electrons let's add the other half i mean and we can do that just by adding and subtracting the other half which in a uh, more uh, another way to express the same thing is that uh, we split this up in its symmetric and its anti-symmetric part so here we have the symmetric part and here the anti-symmetric part and as you can see what we basically just did we, we we take this one divided by two so we split it up in two terms so here we have one half of it and there we have one of half one half of it and then we add the one where we have interchanged the indices so here x p y z we add it here and since we also subtract it there we actually have done nothing uh, um, so this is actually the same so here we have now a um, an expression which is symmetric at the two indices and here it's anti-symmetric and that one hopefully you can immediately recognize as being uh, the y component of the angular momentum of electron i and since we sum over all electrons this is just the y component of the total angular momentum of the electrons divided by uh, two now let's look at this uh, term here and um, let's try to rewrite it again again in principle I just could evaluate this uh, uh, evaluate the transition moments over that if we want to calculate it but we want to try to get some more physical understanding of what it is so therefore let's try to rewrite this and again use the fact that uh, the canonical momentum operator or component of the canonical momentum operator is actually the same as the commutator of the of the corresponding component of the position vector at the Hamiltonian so instead of having pix we can write the commutator of xi with the Hamiltonian and correspondingly here for um, 
set. Um, and uh, what we also can do, because now we have uh, now we have only position vectors, so uh, I can switch them around. Because you see, I've sort of interchanged the order of that. Okay, so that's that's our operator. Now let's insert that in uh, our transition moment here. So we actually get uh, uh, two contributions. Now we get a contribution from the y component of the total angular momentum operator of the electrons, as I said before. And we have now this one here, where we have two components, two components of the position vector, and this Hamiltonian, which is the unperturbed Hamiltonian of the system. And here in the transition moment, remember, we have the unperturbed wave functions of the system, which means these are eigenfunctions of this Hamiltonian, and therefore we can let the Hamiltonian act on them, um, here to the right, and this one to the left, uh, which means we are going to get uh, energies because if that if that Hamiltonian acts on this state, we get the energy of this state, which is uh, En, um, and correspondingly we get E0 e here to the right, and uh, then we take can take the energies of course out of the integral, so I've collected them here, and I put them in the opposite order, therefore I get a minus sign in front of it. So here we can we have our excitation energy, which is very nice, and now we have this transition moment, this transition moment where we have uh, sort of this quadratic term where we have two different components position of the position vector of the electrons. Um, and that that is nothing else than just uh, a second electric moment operator. Um, remember in the beginning of uh, chapter 3 where we were talking about moments, we had the first order moment uh, and this is going to be the uh, second electric moment operator then. Um, right, now let's go back for a second. So what we have now, here we have now a second electric moment operator and here we have the angular momentum operator. And there you should remember that the uh, angular momentum operator is essentially the operator which is inside of the magnetic dipole moment operator. The magnetic dipole moment operator is essentially just the angular momentum operator with some natural constants which means we can uh, identify these two, these two contributions to the next uh, term in the expansion of the uh, transition moments as being uh, second electric and first magnetic because it's a magnetic dipole. So we can write um, the operator and therefore that's precisely what one writes here. So we have here uh, um, the second electric uh, transition dipole moment operator, so uh, or dipole moment. So here we have uh, E, electric, and second, uh, whereas uh, the second term it's M, so it's magnetic, and it's the first, so it's magnetic dipole and uh, electric, uh, second electric. And that confirms what we actually already had uh, before um, when we discussing chapter four and five, before we had the electric moments. Uh, where we went to electric dipole and second electric, which is electric quadrupole. Whereas in the chapter five for the magnetic, we only went to the magnetic dipole and therefore uh, I made a statement about that sort of the second electric and the first magnetic would belong together in the order of uh, importance. And here you can explicitly see it that they actually appear together. Now, in the beginning of this lecture, uh, we talked about that one can obtain the transition moments, transition strength actually, square of them, as the as a residuum of the linear response function. So the question is, what kind of linear response function do we need in order to get these uh, transition moments? Well, the electric quadrupole transition moment, we obviously can get from the quadrupole polarizability, because that's um, the linear response function where we have two of these where we have these operators as our operators, the um, electric uh, dipole moment transition moments we of course get from the frequency dependent dipole dipole polarizability, the quadrupole we get from the quadrupole polarizability, and the last one the magnetic um, we could get or we get uh, if you look at that uh, the response function that is actually the, the paramagnetic contribution to a frequency dependent magnetizability. Well, in chapter five, we had the, uh, the magnetizability, 
Uh, and uh, we could see there are two contributions. There's a paramagnetic contribution, which is a response function, and there's a diamagnetic contribution, which is just a ground state expectation value. Uh, and what we have here is now the paramagnetic contribution, but the paramagnetic contribution, which is frequency dependent. So it's just the extension of this paramagnetic contribution to the magnetizability to non-zero frequencies. OK, um, usually, as I said, the transition moments are the molecular properties behind the intensity of an absorption. Normally, the, uh, if you look at experimental data, they are not, the intensity is not reported in terms of uh, transition moments or absolute squared of transition moments, but it's normally reported in terms of dipole oscillator strengths, which are dimensionless. And the dipole oscillator strength is defined in the way given here, um, where um, I have here my electric dipole moment transition moments, or the absolute square of them, uh, and it's multiplied with the excitation energy in this uh, um, dipole oscillator strength. And there are uh, some natural constants in order to get rid of the, the units because it is dimensionless. Um, and this, uh, I mean, here we have a vector operator. So essentially, if you evaluate this, you will have um, the absolute square of the x component plus the absolute square of the y component plus the absolute square of the z component. Now, this is here written with uh, the electric dipole moment operator, which means with the position operator of the electrons. And therefore, this is called the length representation of the dipole oscillator strength, because it's calculated from um, the electric dipole moment operator, which essentially is just the position operator uh, of the electrons. Now, um, one can, if one wants to, um, I mean, in order to calculate the oscillator strength here, you need here the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. But well, we actually could uh, um, define kind of a tensor of Cartesian components of this, where I would have different components, x and y and y and z and so forth here. Uh, and then the oscillator strength itself would be the trace of this uh, Cartesian tensor, uh, which and the trace is always the sum of the diagonal elements divided by three. That's where the three comes from. Now, we can again use the uh, off diagonal hypervirial relation to change from, to replace here the uh, position vector operator of the electron by the canonical momentum operator of the electron. And uh, if we do that in both of the transition moments, we get to what is called the velocity representation, where we have now the canonical momentum operator. Uh, and I know it's a bit strange. It's with the canonical momentum operator and it's called the velocity, velocity uh, representation. Um, the off diagonal hypervirial relation, of course, uses the fact that the commutator of the position operator with a Hamiltonian is equal to the canonical momentum operator, um, which means that um, the energy difference here, the excitation energy, uh, the energy, the difference in the energies between the excited state and the ground state, um, that gives us the commutator with the Hamiltonian in here. And therefore, the excitation energies will disappear then. And in reality, it ends up to be 1 over the excitation energy then for the um, velocity representation. We can also do that only once absolute square here. I only replace one of the two operators. <coughs> uh, and that gives the mixed representation. So in this, then I get the mixed representation, which looks like this then. So I have one canonical momentum operator and one uh, position operator here. And I don't have the excitation energies then. So so the expression for the mixed representation does not depend explicitly on the excitation energies uh, any longer. That is actually an important point when you're calculating them, because uh, um, if you do calculation with approximate methods and, and finite basis sets, then the mixed representation actually is uh, much easier to converge, to get a converged result than the length representation. And the worst normally is the velocity representation. Now we can also write it in uh, two different ways. Where we have here um, 
the the two operators in the in the different order and because one of them the canonical momentum operator is purely imaginary if we change from from this to this order we get a change in sign now for optically active molecules meaning chiral molecules um, one can measure what is called a circular dichroism spectra and the intensity of the lines in the circular dichroism spectra are, is related not to the uh, oscillator strength but it's related to the rotational strength which is defined like this where here we have the transition moment it's it's transition moment with the electric dipole moment operator and here we have the transition moment with the magnetic dipole moment operator which means in order to calculate the rotation at strength um, we need to determine the corresponding transition moments as the residuum not of the um, dipole dipole polarizability but of this dipole mixed electric dipole magnetic dipole polarizability tensor g prime which we already looked at uh, in the uh, chapter before when we talked about optical activity optical rotation so it's this optical rotation tensor uh, whose residuum uh, is the rotational strength so to summarize a bit what we have uh, learned so far in this chapter is that to calculate the excitation energies and transition moments or oscillator strengths we can do that from the linear response function or polarization propagator by finding the poles and by finding the residua at each of those poles. And that's a very interesting alternative to the usual way because the usual way would be that one has to calculate uh, the wave function and the energy of the ground state and then the wave function and the energy of each of the excited states and then one can get the excitation energy as a difference between of them. Here from the response function we directly get the excitation energy and we directly get the transition moments so we actually don't need uh, we don't need to get the wave function of the excited states and then from those calculate the transition moments we directly get the transition moments and we can argue that uh, this is actually much more meaningful because in experiments you don't get wave functions you get directly the oscillator strengths as the um, integral underneath the uh, in the integral over the area underneath the, the your absorption peak so and you get the excitation energies from experiment from spectra that's the frequency where you have the absorption and you don't get uh, uh, the energies of ground states or excited states so from the response function we can get get directly what is actually measurable so it's in a way it's much more meaningful to uh, obtain them directly the measurable quantities from the response function which means that response theory is actually the d2 predestinate for the calculation of um, electronic spectrum now let's look how we do that in practice uh, we in order to identify that the singularities the poles of the response function correspond to excitation energies we of course look at the spectral representation or some of the states expressions for uh, the linear response function called also called a polarization propagator but that's of course not the way you want to calculate it because there in order to calculate this uh, um, sum of states expression of course we would need to know all the excited states so that doesn't make any sense so we have to go to our matrix uh, representation of the linear response function or of the polarization propagator, polarization propagator as we had derived it in uh, the end of chapter 3 now there are two ways one can could do that uh, one could do what is called a pole search which would mean that one um, calculates the value of the linear response function for example of the dipole polarizability for uh, many different frequencies and then just identify the frequency at which the you know, polarizability or that linear response function gets very large or gets gets infinite um, that of course means one would have to do a lot of calculation of the response functions uh, for a long time this was not the preferred way to do that but actually nowadays uh, one comes back to it and because if you do that you can directly simulate the whole spectrum 
if you calculate just the, the response function for a lot of different frequencies, you can directly plot the spectrum. But if you're not interested in the whole spectrum, but you're actually only interested in to know what the excitation energies, these called vertical excitation energies, then there's another way to do that. Um, because if you look at the matrix representation of your propagator, you remember there's this big inverse matrix, which is the so-called molecular Hessian minus the frequency times this overlap matrix and the whole thing to the inverse. Um, and of course, the response function has a pole when this inverse becomes, when this matrix of which we take the inverse becomes singular. So we have to find the singularities of this matrix and that's the matrix I'm talking about here. That is what you have in your response function where you have to take the inverse of in, in the response function. And so we're looking for singularities of this matrix. Um, now, the singularity of a matrix is also uh, important when one tries to solve uh, linear equations, which look like this, because these kind of homogeneous linear equations where the right-hand side is zero, only has a meaningful, or only has the non-trivial solution if this matrix here is um, singular or has a singularity. Which means that, that finding the singularity uh, of this matrix is actually equivalent to finding solution or finding out when this set of homogeneous linear equations has solution. Now, and uh, remember, of course, uh, uh, the matrix here depends on the frequency omega, so we have a variable which we can tune. Now, the matrix here, the matrix we are talking about, is not just a general matrix, has a very peculiar form. Um, it has two contributions. I mean, there, there's a minus in the middle, which means I can rewrite this equation in this form. You can just move here uh, h bar times the frequency times the overlap matrix times this um, vector x to the right hand side, and I end up at this expression here. On the left hand side, I have the electronic Hessian matrix E multiplied on this so far not, uh, well, solution vector for the homogeneous linear uh, equation problem is equal to, um, again, h bar times frequency times the overlap matrix and then times again this solution vector. And then we hopefully can recognize this as being an eigenvalue problem. Well, it's, it's a generalized eigenvalue problem because the normal eigenvalue problem, of course, would not have an overlap matrix here or metric matrix, one could call it in, uh, when we talk about eigenvalue problems. So therefore, it's called a generalized eigenvalue. Now I can mathematically show that if we insert here in our matrix as the frequency one of the eigenvalues of, um, I mean, one of the solution of this generalized eigenvalue problem, which are the eigenvalues of our electronic Hessian matrix. So if you insert one of the eigenvalues of the electronic Hessian matrix up here, then our matrix becomes singular. So finding the singularities of our matrix and therefore the singularity of our linear response function actually is equivalent to finding the eigenvalues of our electronic Hessian matrix. And that's the way we do that because uh, we, we can evaluate this matrix and then uh, or we evaluate the E and the S matrix and then we solve this eigenvalue problem and get our uh, excitation energies because that's the values of the frequencies at which the linear response function has a singularity. So we get our excitation energies as the eigenvalues of the uh, electronic Hess X, uh, the solution vector here. That's the eigenvectors of the Hessian matrix matrix. So finding the poles, finding the excitation energy corresponds to solving this electronic eigenvalue problem. Uh, and I've written it up here again. Um, now with, with the explicit expressions for the electronic Hessian matrix here, one of the element that's, um, so remember from chapter three, here we, are, we have our excitation and de-excitation operators and a co double commutator with Hamiltonian, and we just here in the overlap matrix, we just have the commutator of the two uh, excitation operators um, and then the expectation value with our uh, ground state wave function. Um, now the, we want to find also the residuum of this. And it turns out by looking at this, one can mathematically show that the residuum uh, 
is then actually uh, correlated to the eigenvectors because x with the eigenvectors and uh, the product of what we call the property gradient vectors. So our transition moments turn out to be just the product of uh, the eigenvector for the state we're looking at. So for each xi state n, we have one eigenvector uh, xn. And if we multiply this eigenvector with the corresponding property gradient, we get the transition moment.